Uh, thank you for joining this uh, this Friday afternoon. And what is a rescheduled conversation uh, on leadership and in public service uh, with uh, Miss Jenny Piper, the interim head in Northern Ireland Civil Service. Before uh, Jenny and I um, begin our conversation, I'd like to introduce Mr. Andrew Elliott, the director of the Northern Ireland Bureau and the partner for uh, this leadership series. Andrew. Thank you. It's great to join you again, Bob, for this fifth in our series of fireside chats with a focus on leadership. And the Bureau really values its partnership with Boston College on this most important topic. And I'm especially pleased to have the opportunity to introduce Jenny Piper. I have some direct experience of Jenny's leadership style, particularly since she's been my boss in the Northern Ireland Civil Service since the start of December last year. As head of the civil service in Northern Ireland, she has a staff of approximately 25,000, so one of our largest organizations, and she chairs the body of permanent secretaries that in turn uh, lead individual government departments, each under a minister for one of the five big political parties in Northern Ireland. Jenny took up post at a really critical time, uh, just as the biggest COVID wave was kicking off in Northern Ireland and as if that wasn't enough, just as the transitional phase that followed the UK's exit from the EU uh, was coming to an end. Jenny advises and supports the Northern Ireland Executive, which of course is one of the most important institutions of the Good Friday Agreement. Jenny quickly brought leadership skills and experience picked up during her 28 years in the civil service and seven years as chief executive of the Northern Ireland Authority for Utility Regulation to bear and gained the confidence of ministers and initiated significant change in a very short time, including important proposals relating to her own post. Jenny has also, during this time, provided leadership to the University of Ulster during a time of great change. I've known Jenny for almost the entirety of my own civil service career. And I'm really delighted that she's able to join us today and speak to us. I'll now hand back to you, Bob. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, and thank you for your support in this leadership series. Um, it's exciting to continue to investigate um, the political and policy thinking and, and the leadership thinking of people across um, Ireland, Northern Ireland uh, and the United Kingdom. And uh, today we're really, um, Really lucky to have uh, Jenny Piper here with us. Um, Jenny, you, you and I have been conversing um, via email, especially as the the previous session was was rescheduled at, at the last minute, and um, that kind of flexibility and demand um, that is placed on you is uh, as the head of the Northern Ireland Civil Service. We, we were just talking about this, you know, in 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 the green room, waiting for the session to start. That this wasn't really a role that you had anticipated and um, your life is now much busier than than it had been previously in, in an unexpected way I mean so I think the first question that I have for you is why why are you interested in this role and, and what motivated you to take it even though it wasn't something maybe that you had had necessarily planned for well it's a great great opener of a of a question uh, Bob um I had actually retired or uh, I'd retired from full-time employment for, for a whole month uh, last, last uh, October. Um, I'd left the Northern Ireland Civil Service seven years ago um, uh, to head up the utility regulator uh, as a separate organization. Um, I'd been a, a, a civil servant ever since I left Queen's University Belfast. Um, and, and I had no intention of uh, returning to uh, full-time employment when, when I retired in October. Um, I was looking to do different things, maybe some um, charitable work, some non-exec work, um, and maybe a, a little bit of uh, a hobby that has, has grown, uh, a little bit of yoga teaching. Um, but uh, I'd been very conscious that the Northern Ireland Civil Service had been without a leader, without a, a head of service, um, since my predecessor retired uh, in, in August. Um, I'd speculated on who might, who might take the role uh, and I was uh, very surprised to be out hiking in the Mourne Mountains one day when I got the call to say uh, that the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister wanted to have a, a conversation with a purpose, I think it's called, um, with a view to me filling the, the role of Head of the Civil Service on an interim basis. They'd had a competition previously. I wasn't interested. Um, I, as far as I was concerned, my civil service career was was over, um, and I was moving on to something else. 
Um, but it's quite a powerful thing to have both the first and the, the deputy first minister uh, approach you and say, um, we both like the way you work. We know your track record. We need somebody to lead the civil service for uh, a relatively short period of time to maybe redesign and reshape the role and to, to have a new competition, a different competition for a permanent successor to, to lead the organization going forward. Um, and, and, and to paraphrase um, um, Mario Puzzo, um, uh, they made me an offer I couldn't refuse. Uh, so uh, I, I came back in uh, at the start of um, uh, December uh, and uh, I'm due to finish at some stage in the summer when my successor is appointed. It did seem like um, a good opportunity to make a difference, a good opportunity to fill a gap, uh, the interregnum that was there with no one at the centre. Um, and after 30 odd years in the civil service, uh, I had a lot of friends, uh, including Andrew, uh, throughout the civil service. And I knew how they were struggling um, without someone at the centre. Um, so uh, I came back, if I'm really honest, not for the politicians. Uh, I came back for uh, my colleagues, my friends, um, and to pro provide some direction and support for, for the senior team um, during what has proved to be a really extraordinary, a really extraordinary period in, um, in, in Northern Ireland's uh, history uh, through COVID and Brexit, um, through some really, um, really dreadful scenes um, on the streets of, of Northern Ireland, um, ongoing fragility in the political process, um, the death of a, a, a member of the royal family in the middle of it, and now um, you know, a leadership uh, crisis within the Democratic Unionist Party. So uh, I think I'm probably getting in, in the space of my short interim tenure, um, I, I'm getting the chance to experience you know, the full <laughs> the full gamut of what might face uh, a head of service uh, over a period of years normally. Uh, yeah, it, it definitely is um, an active period f for you um, in that leadership role. And we'll come to, to, to each of these pieces um, as we go. Uh, I want to thank people for joining us today and on this rescheduled event and staying with us. Um, please, if you have questions, ask them via either the chat function or the Q&A, and, and I'll, I'll pick those up. I suspect there will be a lot of questions, and I do encourage people um, to, to send their questions. I received one um, three weeks ago by email that, that we will get to. Uh, but before we do get to that, um, you talked about being brought in by the First Minister and Deputy First Minister to kind of reshape the role. Um, and that's something, and we will talk a lot more about this, that, that you have done in, re, you've reshaped leadership roles in many different organizations. We'll talk about the work that you did as a utility regulator. I mean, what are you doing now um, to, to reshape this role and to shape the, you know, the, the hire and, and how it will, and how the role of the head of the Northern Ireland Civil Service will function, you know, both with the executive and, and with the civil service itself? So uh, the job I do at the moment, really, uh, Bob, has three parts to it. Um, I'm head of a department of about three, 350, 360 staff with a multi-million pound budget and a big delivery program uh, of cross-departmental initiatives such as um, developing urban villages, um, tackling paramilitarism, uh, supporting uh, initiatives uh, dealing with violence against women and girls. So very wide ranging cross cutting portfolio. Um, I'm accounting officer for that department. Uh, and that is a big, a big job, a permanent secretary job running a department. But I'm also then secretary to the Northern Ireland executive. So supporting the ministers, the ministerial team, uh, the five party mandatory coalition that is the Northern Ireland executive. So I support them in terms of um, processing of business, handling of papers, um, guidance on ministerial codes um, and standards, um, all that good civil service administrative stuff, uh, but important to keep confidence in, in the organization. And then I am the, the overall uh, leader for the 22-23 uh, the, the, the thousand uh, civil servants. So it's it's too big a job. And my, my assessment when I came in was that's too big a job. Um, so what I've done 
uh, since I came in December is, is with minister's support, I've split the job so that my successor will essentially perform, I think, what I would describe as a more traditional chief executive type job. So sitting as uh, the leader of the organisation, <laughs> of, of the, the, the various government departments in Northern Ireland, managing them operationally, leading the senior team, but also then as a chief executive, looking up to support the board, the cabinet, the Northern Ireland executive. And the role I currently play in terms of running the executive office, what used to be known as um, the Office of the First and Deputy First Minister, OFM, DFM, um, that's now going to be a separate role completely discreet um, and that that will allow um, that will allow my successor to be much more focused on that dual chief executive type role and I suppose what I whenever I proposed this to first and deputy first minister I was really bringing with me my experience of having been the chief executive uh, for for seven years working to an independent board and running very disparate operational departments so it's going to look and feel very different to the role I play. Um, and I think it will allow my successor to be much more focused on supporting ministers and on doing that leadership and transformation job, which needs to be done uh, across the wider civil service. I hope that makes sense. No, that's interesting. Um, can you talk a little bit about that role supporting um, ministers? It's, it's, it's really fascinating. And I think um, for a lot of people in the United States, um, you know, the idea of cabinet government is, you know, it's, it's an anomaly for us. Um, and then add that further to the unique situation that Northern Ireland has where, you know, you have a first minister and a deputy first minister who are from uh, different parties who have, you know, maybe different programs for government. Um, is, you know, how do you ensure that or how do you help facilitate the conversations between ministers to help you know, storm and function and legislate and, and deliver on its re executive responsibilities? I think the truthful answer to that is um, I do it some days better than others. Um, <laughs> and, you know, the, the key relationships are with the first and the deputy first minister because they are joint heads of government. And papers that come forward from civil servants with proposals, whether they're spending proposals or policy <laughs> initiatives, papers that come forward to board the cabinet essentially um, need need to have um, some degree of endorsement from both the first and the deputy first minister. Now occasionally papers will come forward that they don't agree on but generally my job is to try and broker agreement between those two two politicians from very different parties, very strong philosophical and political differences but actually uh, a lot of the time I'm trying to find consensus and common ground about the things they do agree on uh, in terms of delivering services for citizens, in terms of economic development, community progress and support for, you know, the most vulnerable in Northern Ireland. So um, it's, a, I suppose it's a bit like, you know, um, what the diplomatic service must, must be like. There's quite a lot of shuttle diplomacy between first and deputy first minister. But then we have you know, three, three other parties involved. Um, uh, the, the SDLP, Social Democratic uh, and Labour Party, fundamentally, a, a, or basically a nationalist uh, party. We have the Alliance Party, which um, is a broader church um, for, uh, with, with no particular uh, leanings either to unionism or, or nationalism. Uh, and then we have another uh, pro-union party, the, the Ulster Unionist Party. Um, and they are smaller parties. So there's a big job to be done um, to, to bring them in, to involve them in the decision making um, so that they don't just see it as a carve up between the two big parties, Sinn Féin uh, and the DUP. Um, so at the moment, I don't spend enough time, frankly, doing that shuttle diplomacy and trying to work with ministers and build up trust and confidence because I have a lot of other things um, to, to do and to deliver. So one of the great things I think um, for my successor is that they're going to have a bit more time and a bit more bandwidth to really try and make the executive work more effectively. Some days it works, some weeks it works really well. Um, and we find issues 
on which all of the parties can agree. Um, and that's and that's good and we get really good discussion and debate. But frankly, there are other times whenever we know we are dealing with things that um, you know, fundamentally divide the parties. Um, and that's very difficult. So part of my job might be to try and break those difficult issues down into smaller pieces um, to, to get agreement on, on, you know, baby steps, on little, on little bits, little gains where we can build up a bit of trust and confidence. Um, and I rely very heavily, frankly, on the senior team of permanent secretaries who run the, the, the various departments um, to work with me on that in terms of knowing what their minister's priorities are and how far they're prepared to, to go and to flex. Um, so um, I suppose for, you know, you, th there are maybe some in, in, in the audience who'd be familiar with, um, you know, the TV series Yes Minister. Um, uh, long, an old, old series now, but I, I know many folk in, in the US really enjoyed that as an insight into, into the, the British uh, parliamentary and civil service system. So it is a bit of that, you know, Sir Humphrey role. Um, now, hopefully I'm not trying to pull the wool over anyone's eyes as much as, as, as Sir Humphrey did, but um, a lot of that working behind the scenes uh, and trying to bring stakeholders together to build consensus for, for issues. Um, it's, it's sometimes it's herding cats, Bob, as, as you might imagine. Um, um, no, that, I mean, it, it's, it's very interesting and I'm sure it's a, it, it's a, it's a really exciting and rewarding um, environment when you're able to, to, to uh, bring parties together. But of course, like this week we learned it's just not the inter-party issues that uh, might challenge you, In, inter-party issues might. And uh, Arlene Foster will be stepping down soon. I mean, how does that make your job different now? And are you able to do shuttle diplomacy still, or does the things need to wait for the DUP process to work themselves out? Well, I think, um, you know, it's difficult and there's there's a lot I probably can't say, um, but, you know, if, if you'd like to have me back at some stage in three months time, I might be able to reflect um, once I'm outside of this job on, on what has happened. I think that the, the key challenge is the level of uncertainty, the level of increased uncertainty that it brings to all aspects of, of um, public life and um, not really knowing what direction uh, the DUP is, is going to go in. Looks like it's going to go in a, a, into a more um, right wing, hard line, fundamentalist direction. That, that seems to be the direction of travel, but we don't know. I think the good thing um, is that uh, uh, Arlene Foster has uh, been clear that she's going to stay on till the end of, of June as, as uh, First Minister until the, the leadership uh, is sorted. We, we break um, in Northern Ireland for the summer holidays early in July. And um, so that maybe offers a little bit of breathing space. Um, but, you know, the, it's, it's the, the relationship which First and Deputy have built up over a period of time, particular, particularly during the COVID crisis. Um, that has been a unifying um, a unifying factor for all of the parties as they've come together to you know in the executive to try and deal with the pandemic, um, and we are well advanced now, as indeed are are you, thankfully, uh, in the US, well advanced on the vaccination program, well advanced on the lifting of of restrictions. Um, so, I would hope that if all goes well. By the time the summer recess for the politicians comes, we will have worked through most, if not all, of the COVID restrictions. We'll be looking towards, you know, the end of the summer, you know, start of school term and so on in September, seeing a return to normality. And yes, there may be then a change of personnel, but I think if we can, if we can keep going till the summer, then that will that will help. Um, just reassure everyone on, on all sides. It's a, always a difficult time in Northern Ireland between Easter um, and, and uh, the summer because there are a whole series of significant cultural and historical uh, events. People are familiar with the, the 12th of July uh, celebrations, but we have a number of other commemorations and, and issues coming up between now and then. So it's, it's a sensitive time and I think uh, the DUP and Sinn Féin are both very cognizant of the need to continue to provide stability and leadership. And so my job is, is to try and, 
and help uh, deliver as much uh, as is possible that will will maintain that stability. Um, it remains to be seen um, where things go. We could see a significant change of ministerial portfolios, as well as a change of direction, potentially a, a harder line direction from the DUP, and that will that will present um, significant challenges then for the nationalist parties in particular who want to pursue uh, an agenda linked to the new decade, new approach document that includes things like uh, an Irish language bill. Um, that that may well be um, more strongly opposed by by a, a, a more right wing democratic unionist party, but look, um, it's easy to pick out all of the negatives. I think there's a huge body of work that all executive ministers are focused on uh, in terms of delivering um, a, a more stable um, place in in Northern Ireland um, and and rebuilding the economy. I suppose uh, post COVID. So everyone is, is certainly at the moment very focused on making sure that this isn't a, a crisis in terms of delivery for citizens. Um, but I think we will be facing into a, a challenging period, um, no doubt about it. I, I think people here um, in the US will be um, enthusiastic to hear that and, and support um, the continued work of the, the executive. And I know people here in Massachusetts, especially, um, are hopeful that the, the executive is able to continue its work and, and um, you know, uh, support Northern Ireland and, it, and, it, and its development. Um, and we'll return to some of those issues, I think, uh, and some of those policy issues as we go here a little bit. But, you know, one thing that is also changing here, and I think I know is important to you, um, is the, the is the nature of the leadership in a different way. Um, for the first time, you had a first minister and deputy first minister ahead of Northern Ireland Civil Service who were all uh, women. Um, and you spoke about this a little bit in the, the Choose to Challenge um, campaign video. Where you, you highlighted three things that women should do. You asked women uh, to believe that they're more capable um, of what they believe they are capable of, um, to be afraid of mistakes and to develop resilience. I mean, in the context of Northern Ireland, um, and we know there's a long history of women and political activism and change in Northern Ireland. I mean, what, what, what do you see as the future for women in Northern Ireland? Is there opportunity now that there wasn't before? Or do you see, uh, what kind of things do you see for women in leadership roles in the North? Look, um, uh, I'm I'm very pleased that um, I'm the first woman to have uh, have have held this particular role. Uh, it, it's only taken a hundred years um, uh, since the creation of, of Northern Ireland and, and the beginning of the Northern Ireland Civil Service to have a woman in in this job. Um, and I think it's really it's been really really interesting to see uh, what's happened in the US. Um, I think there were. You know, there were cheers from uh, women uh, all around the globe and, and, and many of us here in Northern Ireland to hear President Biden um, ac acknowledge Vice President Harris and Speaker Pelosi uh, the other day. That was a that was a real, a really fantastic moment. Um, and I think just sends such a strong signal um, of, of the confidence and the change that there has been. I suppose, Bob, if, if I reflect a little bit, um, you know, my my parents were were both civil servants. Uh, they both joined the civil service, even though they had scholarships to go to university. It was at a time when their families couldn't afford to to let them go off to university, so uh, they both had to go into employment. Um, they were both active in the trade unions uh, at the time, campaigning for equality, for gender equality uh, at the time. Uh, and it was a deep irony that uh, when my mum and dad married. Uh, my mother was forced to to retire from the civil service because at the time that there was a marriage bar uh, you couldn't have uh, married civil servants um, and it was the woman that uh, that had to sacrifice uh, their role and and as you might imagine that had quite a strong um, a strong influence on me uh, and on on my parents in terms of encouraging me not to see um, barriers uh, in my way uh, and to you know they, they knew things were changing um, but it's been slow progress. Um, it has been slow progress. But look, I, if I look around Northern Ireland at the moment, yes, we've had Arlene and Michelle in the two top political jobs. Um, I've been, uh, I'm in the head of the civil service job. The attorney general for Northern Ireland is female. Uh, the chief executive of the biggest local government organization in Northern Ireland um, is, is, uh, uh, is female. And there are a rising number 
of senior uh, public women who are finding their feet and finding their voice um, because there is, a, there is a, a greater degree of openness. But it is the reality that Northern Ireland remains quite a parochial society. Um, and, and, you know, there are, uh, are many out there who uh, still think uh, a woman's place uh, and the best thing that a woman can do is be a, a wife, mother and daughter. Um, so I think it's up to uh, it's up to people like Arlene and Michelle, me, the Attorney General, um, other women in, in senior visible uh, positions. It's up to us to show and talk about what can be done and what can be achieved. Uh, and really that challenge to change piece was about reflecting on some of the, the barriers that, that I've had to face and overcome. I haven't ever seen um, a glass ceiling. Um, if it's been there, I've, you know, I've, I've just tried to, to, to work my way through it. Um, and I think women very often um, are put off when they perceive there to be a glass ceiling or a barrier or uh, jobs that are more, you know, more male dominated. Um, very often women are, are put off and don't have the confidence to try. Um, I think my sense in, 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 the, in the US is there's much more of a, that entrepreneurial spirit of it's OK to try and fail. We're, we're, very, we're really not like that uh, in, in, uh, in the UK generally, uh, in these islands. Uh, and I think very many women in, in public service have not been afraid to try something um, and, and see you know, how it goes, how it works. When I left the civil service to try running my own organisation, um, I was heading up a, a team of you know, 100 or so better qualified people than me, you know, professional engineers, statisticians, lawyers. I was the, I was a generalist, the least qualified. My, my background is as a, a, a geologist, um, <laughs> but I'd spent my entire career in, in, um, in public service. Um, but I wanted to try and see if I could get out my, outside of my comfort zone. Um, and what was the worst that could happen? Um, it didn't work. I didn't like it. I couldn't cope. Well, I could try something else. I, I you know, I, I, I felt at that stage in my career, it was worth trying something else and trying to get out of my comfort zone. And I think that's that's a big advantage of a, of a large civil service in Northern Ireland. We are a big employer in a small place, Northern Ireland. And I think there are so many opportunities um, women just very often don't put themselves forward because they see that there's never been a woman has done that particular job. Um, and, and that's one of the things I'm trying to change, to try and open up the opportunities and encourage women to just give it a go um, uh, and see, see how they'll do. Very often, once, once they try it, they actually see that they have more to offer um, and, and that male colleagues, by and large, are, are very welcoming. I've certainly found that in, in my jobs. Um, and, you know, kind of further on to that, are there areas in which Northern Ireland specifically can can improve or are there areas that you would like to see, um, you know, more opportunity or more or more programs or policies that would would address a lack of opportunity or, or facilitate more opportunity? You know, it's um, I'm, I'm not perceiving a lack of opportunity. Um, certainly not. Certainly not uh, when it comes to women, I think. I think we do have much bigger challenges when it comes to wider issues of diversity. We're not a very diverse society. Um, we're quite a polarized society in terms of race and, and religion. And we have big, big challenges now around the LGBTQ agenda. Um, that's that's a, a really a, a difficult one um, uh, for Northern Ireland, but it's, it's something that the Northern Ireland Civil Service has got to grip. Um, if we're wanting to attract uh, young people, new talent and improve diversity and inclusion, um, then there are things that we need to do to, to make the civil service open and, and welcoming. For years, the challenge uh, in Northern Ireland was all about, um, are you Protestant or are you Catholic? Um, that was the issue in terms of the, the employment profile. That shifted then to the male-female balance, and we are seeing uh, more women coming through now. But it was only, um, I think, probably seven, six, seven years ago uh, that we we had more than one female permanent secretary in, uh, across the the nine departments. Um, 
we now have one, two, three, four. Um, so, you know, we're, 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 we're definitely getting there. So there's no, I don't, I'm not seeing any barriers in public service uh, in Northern Ireland, not for women, but I think we have a long way to go on the wider diversity agenda. Um, and, and, and I include disability in that as well. Uh, we need as a service uh, to be much more inclusive. Uh, that's, uh, that's really interesting. I, I'm going to invite uh, people, the, the audience, to ask questions at any time. Just send them through to the chat or, or the Q&A, and I'll, I'll try to work those in. Um, Jenny, we've covered um, a lot of ground so far. We could go deeper into any one of these topics. Before we do, I wanted to talk a little bit about your role as utility regulator, and that um, might strike you know, the, the person on the street is kind of unusual. Uh, they might not think of um, the utility regulator, but in your role as utility regulator, you develop something called an integrated single market, electricity market. Um, and this covered the island of Ireland. And so I was wondering if you could explain what that is um, and why it was important. I, I think it's important, you know, for the audience to know that at the start here, that that was developed in 2018. So this is um, following... The, the, the Good Friday Agreement, but it was not part of the Good Friday Agreement. It's following the Brexit vote. So if you can explain a little bit about what that is and, and, and why it was significant, uh, I think it would it'd take us some way to uh, learning a little bit more about your leadership. Sure. Well, look, um, my work as, as Chief Executive of the Utility Regulator actually built on uh, previous work that I'd done as a civil servant in the Department for the Economy. Um, and that the single, uh, the single market, single electricity market on the island of Ireland was actually created in 2007. Um, I developed the, 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 the policy, uh, led the development of the policy and the legislation uh, that led to that market. The first uh, cross-border electricity market on, on the, uh, in Europe at the time. Um, and it really just came out of, I suppose, um, analysis of the, at the time, the very, very high electricity prices uh, that we had in Northern Ireland, um, a market of about, you know, 850,000 electricity consumers. Now that's really, you know, that's smaller than Manchester. <laughs> um, I, I don't know what the comparison is in, in terms of a, of a US town, um, but it, you know, a really small market hard to get any competition. Um, we were an, uh, you know, isolated in Northern Ireland, no indigenous resources, no oil, no coal, um, dependent on gas coming on a pipeline from Scotland, uh, depending on oil coming into um, to, to terminals and ports. Um, so very hard to get competition in. In the Republic of Ireland, they faced not dissimilar problems. Again, uh, yes, uh, they, they've traditionally had supplies of of peat um, for, for burning in power stations, but really not economic, not competitive. So on the island, two separate, uh, two separate uh, regions, two separate markets, neither of them very competitive. And at a policy level, um, I started dialogue uh, with, with Irish counterparts around how might we create an all island market, very much following European lines and, and you know, Brexit's a bad, a bad word in, in, in many circles, but actually what Europe was trying to do in, in many cases was level the playing field, take away a lot of those differences between regional economies. And the European vision for an energy market was one where you would not see regional price variations, where there would be um, free flow of, of electricity, free trade of electricity right across Europe. And Europe got behind the idea that we could try this and, and see could we make it work on the island of Ireland. So although we have two completely different industry organisations, policy makers working with the regulators worked on a, on a piece of primary legislation which went through um, in parallel in Westminster and in the Irish Parliament, the Doyle, um, that essentially created a single market on the island. And that was, that was fine. It was a very, very simple market, which had just allowed all electricity generated anywhere on the island to be sold into a, a simple pool market and traded that way. That was fine. That was groundbreaking at the time. Europe welcomed it. Uh, it was welcomed, welcomed as a very strong signal of 
what was possible if you took an all island approach and you know that we have an all island approach to tourism um uh, but the, the the market was a really tangible thing that was developed by policymakers and and regulators and when i became chief executive of the utility regulator i wanted to try and see if we could make that if we could improve that model make it even more competitive and so the work that i did on the integrated what became the integrated single electricity market was really try to try and embed a much more competitive market on the island um, that that would um, trade on the same basis as any other country in Europe, whether it was France or Germany, um, Spain, Portugal, um, and would be integrated in that level playing field. The impact of that, the whole purpose in doing it was to help drive down high electricity prices because high prices in Northern Ireland were bad in terms of our levels of fuel poverty, but also bad in terms of attracting investment and industry because it was seen as a, as a major cost of, of locating in Northern Ireland. So, you know, it's been, it's been a successful market. Um, I'd have to be honest and say um, Brexit has challenged it. Um, there are a number of, of tweaks um, that have had to be made uh, to make, to keep the market going. It's an important thing symbolically, I think, um, uh, and I know many of your your US audience would 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 appreciate this. Symbolically, the fact that we've been able to create that single market on the island, um, maybe that harks back to my old geology background because geology doesn't see any doesn't see any borders, and actually the flow of electricity, you know, and the trading of electricity on the island of Ireland doesn't see any borders either. So I think it's a really important project. And, and probably has been the biggest single, um, when I look at my legacy, um, probably the biggest single change that I've been involved in um, uh, as far as uh, my public service career is concerned. Um, there are a couple of questions have come in that touch on a lot of what you said there. Um, there's a question here about renewable green energy and uh, how long do you, do, you, do you foresee a phasing out of fossil fuels and um, is that something um, that is a, a strategic goal, um, you know, for Northern Ireland Civil Service? And, and, and maybe you can explain how that would, have, would impact on the integrated market. Would it make any difference at all to the integrated market? Um, or that, does that function irrespective of the kind of, the, the, the kind of energy you have? Sure. Well, look, um, one, of, one of the things I did when I was a policymaker uh, in the Department for the Economy was uh, develop a, a, an energy strategy uh, that was in 2010 and it was intended that that strategy would take us forward um, to, to 2020 with a target um, a, a target of 40% uh, renewable electricity in Northern Ireland by 2020. Um, we're in 2021 now and we have significantly exceeded that. Um, there are times in Northern Ireland when up to 70% of our electricity is generated from renewable sources, primarily wind. And, and any of you who have visited uh, the island of Ireland before uh, will, will know that uh, that is something we have uh, in plentiful, uh, plentiful supply. Um, so the main source of renewable energy uh, on the island is wind. And of course, the wind doesn't obey uh, borders either. So there's a huge wind potential, as you can imagine, down the west uh, coast of Ireland and into County Donegal in the northwest and, and, and round uh, the northwest of, of Northern Ireland. Um, and we have uh, an all-island um, regulatory body. We have all-island targets. Um, and the Great question that uh, I think is has been asked there is about the phasing out of fossil fuels. Um, we have been very late in Northern Ireland to, to develop a natural gas market, so we still have um, a, a an active natural gas market that I don't see um, being um, being mothballed anytime soon. But what what it does, I think, offer the potential for is for uh, hydrogen technologies to be used and that's something that the department is actively working on now because the gas infrastructure will be there um, and could be used uh, for hydrogen uh, technologies in the future but I think for now the really exciting thing is is 
uh, the amount of, of wind that we can cope with on the system and our, our system operators north and south who run the wires um, have been uh, involved in cutting edge projects to be able to take more and more wind onto the system. The big, the big challenge there is that the wind doesn't always blow and therefore we need some alternative um, form of generation for when the wind doesn't blow. And of course it doesn't blow evenly on the Ar island of Ireland, so we need to reinforce some of the infrastructure again on an all island basis. But I think it's really, I think the work that's been done to, to increase use of renewables um, on the island has been, has been extraordinary. Um, and we're well on the, well on the journey now. Uh, the green agenda is hugely important. And of course, offers opportunities for, uh, for jobs and for new investment. And we're beginning to see that come through with uh, some green growth strategies that, uh, uh, that a number of the departments are pursuing. So I hope that wasn't too techy an answer. Um, oh no, no, it's, uh, it's 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 very interesting. I mean, I, I in in prep for this, I learned a little bit about your work and um, the uh, gas to the west uh, project. And I was surprised uh, to learn about the the limited nature of the gas network, especially when it came to the west of Ireland and and how that was set up. So I think your points are are well taken about um, hydrogen and 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 wind. And uh, there's another question here that touches on um, some of what you were talking about. You were talking about how Brexit has complicated matters when it comes to the um, the single market for electricity. One of the uh, the viewers here would like to know kind of a little bit more broadly about um, the the way the Irish sea border um, and trade with the rest of the UK um, is impacting on, on your portfolio. So it's, it's a little bit broader than just the, the role that the CEO, but I think it does kind of reflect on this concern about kind of Brexit and relationships between Northern Ireland, Ireland and, and, and Great Britain. Yeah. Um, look, it's, I don't think it's any secret to say that um, Brexit has, um, has caused all sorts of problems uh, for us political problems um, around the protocol, which essentially establishes that, uh, that Irish sea border. But the protocol, on the other hand, does give Northern Ireland the best of both worlds uh, in terms of allowing trade uh, uh, on the island of Ireland, uh, trade with Europe, uh, and maintaining the trade links with, with the rest of, of the UK. Um, unfortunately, some of the immediate consequences of Brexit have been to cause delays on goods uh, and livestock uh, entering Northern Ireland from elsewhere. Huge problems in terms of different types of certification. Um, and, and of course, the, the, the European Union is a huge bureaucracy. Um, it has all of its paperwork to make sure, you know, all, all the member states have to abide by the same standards and the same paperwork. But we now in Northern Ireland have, have additional paperwork even for trade with the main, you know, the big island uh, in the UK. And um, we didn't have to have that before, and now we do. And that's causing really, maybe if I give a practical example of where it's causing a, a problem, uh, we, we had a, an incident in the last couple of weeks where uh, someone in Northern Ireland uh, had bought uh, four uh, ponies, four ponies from Dartmoor in, in England. And those ponies uh, travelled up to Scotland to come over on the ferry into Northern Ireland. Um, they'd been bought by a man for his for his children to have on, on the farm. And Dartmoor ponies are, are dinky little ponies, um, you know, very good for uh, you know for, for children who are learning to, to horse ride. Anyway, these ponies, when they came in to the port of Northern Ireland, didn't have the right paperwork. Bad ponies. Um, you know, the, the paperwork that had been filled in as they travelled on their journey up the UK and across to Northern Ireland was incomplete. And under the protocol rules, those ponies um, should not have been allowed entry to Northern Ireland. Um, they should have been sent back uh, to, to, to Scotland uh, and returned because they didn't have the right paperwork. And this is all to do with, you know, animal hygiene. Uh, and, and, you know, the, the risk uh, of the transfer of disease, um, which is a desirable thing whenever you're moving livestock and same applies to plants. But it became a bit of a cause celebre here uh, in terms of, you know, the protocol ponies. Um, and the, the man who had bought them, uh, you know, 
didn't have the money to send them back because he would have had to pay the bill to send them back. He didn't have the money. Um, the minister intervened in a heroic gesture. Um, and despite the fact that the paperwork wasn't correct, uh, he saved the protocol ponies because there were only two options for them, go back or, or go, to, uh, go to the abattoir. That was that was it. Um, so uh, the ponies were saved. They have uh, they haven't got the right paperwork yet, uh, but they are, are are happy in the field uh, to to which they were intended to go to. But it's just there are things like that, and that's a very that's a, maybe a slightly you know humorous. Um, well, it would have been humorous if they'd gone to the abattoir, of course. But you know, it's but it's just a little microcosm of some of the problems we have issues as well with some of some of the rules around customs and, and companies in, in GB in particular, all of a sudden treating Northern Ireland as if it was Europe um, and, and you know applying postage or delivery charges that would be the same as if something was going from say, London to um, you know, Madrid. Uh, so lots of teething problems lots of queues and a backlog of lorries and so on. And unfortunately, those, those sort of practical problems around bureaucracy and process and so on have taken and are taking some time to work through. The impact of that has been to cause huge frustration and dissatisfaction uh, amongst some, some communities. Farmers are frustrated. Some businesses are very frustrated that they can't order what they used to be able to order. They've got to go through all this extra paperwork that adds to cost. So, I mean, many of those issues, I think, will work themselves out in time. But unfortunately, some of them really have uh, irritated sections of the community, particularly the unionist community, who now see the protocol not as a good thing that would give Northern Ireland the best of both worlds, but as actually a barrier to trade with and, and, and a barrier to Northern Ireland being part of the United Kingdom. There's something different about Northern Ireland. We're being treated differently. And that has, that has precipitated a lot of anxiety uh, amongst unionists. Uh, I'm really trying to simplify some of this, but some of it will pass but some of it will, some of it will remain. Um, and I think it has just opened up uh, a lot of pent up frustration um, about, about the threat to the, uh, what many people see as a threat to Northern Ireland as part of the, the United Kingdom. It, uh, complicated times for uh, someone in your role, of course, uh, to, to try to manage that. Um, I, I mean, do, do you see, you know, from the civil service perspective, is there a way out of this or, or a way through it or is this something that is a political um, issue strictly? I think there are some things the civil service can do in terms of, of working through the bureaucracy. I mean, that's what we are uh, as civil servants. We love our paperwork. Um, and I think, you know, some additional resources at ports, additional civil servants to process the paperwork, you know, will help with time. It's already much, much better now than it was back in January. We are seeing people getting used to it, people working through it now. And I'm talking here about, you know, companies trading, supermarkets trading, um, you know, between, between the, the, the islands. Um, but there is a strong political element to it now. There is a, there was a narrative, which I think was quite uh, unhelpful for a while that went around that said that the, the purpose of the protocol was to ensure that there was no border on the island of Ireland. And that is that is true in part. You know, it, it means that there isn't there isn't any hard stop border if you're trading goods north and south, Dublin to Belfast, um, Cork to Derry, you know, there, there isn't any there isn't any border to travel on on the roads. There isn't any uh, trade border there, customs border. Um, and that is a really good thing. It offers real opportunities for Northern Ireland uh, and indeed for the island as a whole. Um, but it does, it does, has brought back to the surface a lot of those old political fears uh, in terms of, you know, a united Ireland by the back door and a break with, uh, with the United Kingdom and, and with, uh, with the Union. So uh, there's some work that civil servants can do, but at the core of this are quite fundamental political, political differences. Um. 
a, a very good civil servant answer. So thank you. Um, I, <laughs> I, uh, there's a question here from Ronnie Millar. Ronnie is uh, the director of the Rian Immigrant uh, Center here in Boston. And Ronnie is from Northern Ireland originally. Um, and he is probably wondering something that a lot of people are wondering, and I'm surprised I haven't asked it myself yet. Um, so what are your hopes for the new U.S. administration's investment and involvement in Northern Ireland? The, you know, um, the previous administration um, appointed a, a special envoy um, you know, towards the end of, of the administration, but um, President Biden is um, much more interested in Ireland. And um, have you seen any changes? And, and, and what do you think of, uh, about the, Ronnie's question? Um, you know, I think it's a big question. We could spend we could spend the entire time talking about that question uh, alone. Um, you know, I I I think it was um, it was it was great to be part of the St Patrick's Day dialogue between uh, President Biden, uh, First Minister, and Deputy First Minister. Um, uh, it, you know, in another year, um, if it had, hadn't been a COVID year. I might have been in in uh, in DC um, for the St Patrick's Day celebrations. Um, you know, the US has been a great friend over many years uh, to to the island of Ireland, uh, and I I see a, a change in focus and emphasis and a re a reawakening of the the interest in what is happening um, on this island. Um, I think successive presidents have been supportive. Um, of economic development, of social change and social development. There's been tangible US investment um, in, um, in manufacturing and in services here. There's been tangible uh, US support for a whole range um, of uh, community and economic development uh, initiatives. Um, I, I have to tell my, uh, my Bill Clinton story and it's okay. It's a safe story. Uh, he uh, he he was over um, some years ago. Whenever I was a relatively junior uh, official, um, he spoke at the Derry Chamber of Commerce. Uh, and at the time, uh, uh, his wife Hillary Clinton was very active with a number of women's groups here in Belfast. Um, she was a fantastic role model. Um, she was great in encouraging a lot of young people from vulnerable communities and marginalised communities. Um, and um, I got myself an invitation to a dinner at which uh, former President Clinton was was speaking because of my role at the time uh, working in community development. Um, and, and a friend of mine was the photographer for the evening uh, and was taking, as you might imagine, taking lots of photographs. At one point he said, come on and get your photograph taken. Um, at one of my proudest moments, um, I, I was brought up to the top table uh, introduced to President Clinton, was shaking his hand, had my photograph taken, um, and he said, uh, what, what area of work are you in? And I said, well, actually, I've been working um, in some of the community development projects that um, your, your wife has been working in, and she's been a great champion for us and given visibility and profile and confidence uh, to the community, uh, at which point he said, oh, I think we, 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 we ought to have a better photograph than just shaking hands. So uh, I'll say no more, but we did get a better photograph. Um, but the, the point there is that, you know, the interest, the continuing interest of such a big player as the US in what's happening in Northern Ireland does help give confidence um, to, to people and communities in Northern Ireland. I think there's a huge amount can be done. The, the support for you know, political progress over many years has, has been invaluable. And I think you know, there may be opportunities in the future um, as we struggle through what I think is you know, maybe gonna be a challenging period. We're going to have elections again in Northern Ireland this time, this time next year. Um, I hope the executive uh, is, is, is in place all the way through to those, uh, to those elections. But I think we will face um, some really difficult political challenges, um, not least those created by Brexit. And it may well be um, that, you know, um, friends, supporters, colleagues, envoys, president, vice president um, can help if we get into some difficulties, because very often that wider vision, that wider perspective uh, that folk from the US can bring is really helpful to us as we get very inward looking at times with our all of our own um, our, our own little problems. So I think at, at, at every level that I've experienced, the interest and support from the US um, has, has been really fundamental to, to helping Northern Ireland make progress. 
Um, Jenny, I know we're peppering you with questions, but a lot are coming in here. Um, I do want to get to one from um, Hannah Francis. Hannah is a graduate of a BC program. Uh, she has a very specific question about how coaching and mentoring has been important to your career. Um, and do, do you think in general it's important for um for coaching and mentoring programs to be developed and, and do you see a possibility of one developing within the, the civil service? So I've been lucky enough over over many years to you know to avail of different coaching and, and mentoring programs. Um, and I find some of the most valuable ones actually not to be um, to be within the civil service, but actually to have involved other organizations outside of the civil service that have brought a different perspective. So, um, you know, for example, I was lucky enough to, to study at the Kennedy School for a while um, and, and um, you know, work with um, the, the, the late great um, Dan Fenn, um, whom, whom many of you will, will remember uh, from, from Harvard. Um, and, and I made a number of contacts there because that programme that I was on brought together people from not just the Northern Ireland Civil Service, but the wider public sector and indeed involved a number of, of civil servants from, uh, from elsewhere on the island. And I've maintained some of those links in terms of learning and watching and seeing what they've do that they, they've been doing over the years. And it has been maybe a, like a light touch and um, personal mentoring. Um, the experience that I had in at the, the, the Federal Executive Institute in Charlottesville. Um, I was there for a six week program, again, allowed me to see the real value of coaching and mentoring. And I still keep in contact with one of the tutors there who has been a really great touchstone, um, you know, over, over many years when I've, I've faced real, you know, existential difficulties in, in, in um, you know, in, in the job I'm doing um, and being able to look to her as a mentor, you know, just to reflect a different perspective. But the question was about mentoring within the civil service and there is there's active mentoring and coaching that goes on that I think is really important but I was trying to approach that question not so much in terms of the mentoring that is within the civil service which I think is so important but actually the challenge for me was to to look beyond the safe space of the civil service and look to develop um you know mentoring um, opportunities elsewhere and that's actually what I would be encouraging a lot of people uh, particularly you know younger women who are, are just maybe at, at that brink of of moving from from middle management and, and wondering about a senior career um, I actually think getting external perspectives and external coaching and mentoring is 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 really important um, and it's 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 maybe more invigorating than than the very you know the narrow closed um, circle, but one is what I mean. The two are the two are equally valuable. But my, my perspective has been, my experience has been, it's good to look. It's good to look elsewhere. Does, um, I hope that answers the question. Um, I suspect it doesn't really, but. <laughs> No, I mean, it, 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 it aligns with, with your, your history um, and uh, from your experience. So I think it's, a, it's an honest answer so, um, and, and, and a good one. So thank you. There is a question here that is um, deceptively short. It's a massive question. I'm going to let you break it down as best you possibly can uh, or however you want to. I mean, and you have some experience with this. You're the pro chancellor at the University of Ulster. Um, but a teacher from Lurigan has a question. I would like to know your thoughts on what role does education have in creating a more inclusive Northern Ireland? And, and that's, um, that's, a, that's a very big question. But um, perhaps you have a, a way of, of approaching that and, and making it a, a little bit more manageable for uh, the work that you've done. Yeah. So it's it's just a really great question. Um, on a, we, we have a very complicated education system here uh, in in Northern Ireland, and it's um, I suppose to keep it simple, it's it's primarily broken down and, and arranged on on religious lines, um, and that can only, in my view, that can only but reinforce the divisions in society. Um, I sent my kids to a school that didn't have a particular Protestant or Catholic ethos. Uh, the school they went to 
uh, the school motto was in Irish, um, not in English. Um, my son and daughter both uh, learned Irish dancing and Irish traditional music, even though that would not be the natural background um, that, that, that I would come from. Um, certainly not the perceived background that I would come from. Um, where I have seen most evidence of progress, I have to say, um, has been where not necessarily education has been, has had an integrated badge because integrated education in Northern Ireland has a particular badge. It is a particular thing and schools can receive additional support for being integrated. And by integrated, I mean um, welcoming both uh, Catholic and Protestant uh, children. My experience hasn't been so much around integrated schools as around opportunities for school children to mix and integrate in other activities. So whether that's through sporting activities, through um, you know, drama, um, through, um, I suppose, music, uh, music clubs, extracurricular activities, um, through mixing out of school, um, that has been uh, as important, um, uh, I would say, as, as a lot of, of the more formal structures to support integrated education. Having said all of that, until we get to a point where our children are educated um, in similar ways, without a religious uh, focus, where there, are, you know, where there is, I was going to say a single history taught, but that's probably way too simplistic. Um, but where there isn't, a, you know, there there isn't, so there aren't so many labels as you know, nationalist history or Protestant history, um, where we get away from that and where children are mixing and don't see the differences. And, and like most children don't. We see a lot of polarization on the streets. I think education has a critical, a critical role to play there. But I think we need to lift our gaze beyond just saying the answer is 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 have the schools all integrated. I think you know parents will choose to have their children educated in different schools and in different ways. I think it's more about creating opportunities for the children to mix and not actually see the differences. And you know, I, I spent um, three years of my career working uh, in social and community development and urban regeneration. And I saw how easy it is, particularly in deprived communities, for, you know, for the polarization to become really, really entrenched, particularly in those communities that um, are under, you know, the shadow of, of, of some paramilitary or criminal control. There, the children are, you know, they, they don't have the same opportunities to mix. They're in, you know, deprived communities, they're in more vulnerable areas. So all of those programs that take children out and allow them um, to, to mix are, are hugely, hugely important. And, and a lot of the work I did in that particular department was about creating those opportunities, safe, safe places for children to play, shared space um, for communities to mix. And as Northern Ireland, you know, as, as the economy has developed, um, a lot of those old barriers have broken down. But as, as most of your the viewers will, will be aware, um, it doesn't take very much to see some flashpoints re-emerge and see children from those vulnerable communities under the influence of, of the criminal and the paramilitary elements again. So, you know, there's a there's there's no easy answer. It's got to it's got to include schools. It's got to include community development. It's got to include housing, economic opportunities, um, right across right across the board. But education, for sure, is 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 a key piece, um, and it's a very complicated picture right now. So again, that's probably a waffly civil service um, answer. If it were easy, if it were simple, I think we would have cracked the education one. Um, but it's. Um, it's baby steps, um, and I can see we 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 had a, another uh, another um, significant development uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago um, with one of the, the the big Catholic schools applying for and securing uh, integrated status. Um, and again, that's a uh, you know we we are seeing schools change their approach. We're seeing them change their ethos, and I think it's better that that happens. Um, on an evolutionary basis, rather than something that is imposed by government. I hope that makes sense, and I hope that that 
in part gets to, to, to maybe what the questioner was, was asking. Well, thank you, Jenny. I, I, I appreciate um, your answer and I appreciate your time. Uh, education um, is uh, controversial around the world. Um, it's an issue here in the United States. It's an issue in Canada as, as well. It's complicated um, and there are no straightforward answers. It's especially difficult in Northern Ireland. But I want to thank you today for your, for your time and your frank answers. I, I, I'm eager to welcome you to Boston College. Um, I, hopefully, uh, you'll be free to visit us um, in the fall. I expect we'll be open um, and welcoming visitors in the fall. I think there's much more for us to talk about. I really feel like we only scratched the surface on, on several of these um, issues. And I wanna thank the audience for their great questions and their engagement today. Um, thank you again, Jenny. Um, and, and thank you to the Northern Ireland Bureau for uh, their support of, of this event and this series. Well, look, uh, I'd, I'd love to come back and do a reflective piece whenever I might be freer to, to talk, Bob. And if that's in the fall, I can't think of anywhere nicer. <laughs> Excellent. The fall, we hope, will be beautiful here. Um, everything will be open and, and the leaves and, and, and the crisp uh, evenings and warm days. Um, New England in the fall is, is spectacular. Um, thank you for your time today. I really do appreciate it. It was excellent. Thanks, Bob. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Thanks, Take care, everybody. everybody. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Bye-bye.